نحمده و نسلی علی رسوله الكریم اعوذ بالله من الشیطان الرجیم بسم الله الرحمن الرحیم رب اشرح لی صدری و یسر لی امری و احلل عقدتم من لسانی یفقه قولی و جعل لی وزیر من احلی اللهم فكهنا في الدين رب زدني علما اللهم إني أسألك علما نافعا رزقا طيبا وأملا متقبلا آمين سم آمين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته سورة الأنفال This surah was revealed in Medina with 75 verses and 10 stanzas and 8th by the order of arrangement. As far as the period of revolution is concerned, it was revealed uh, two years after the immigration of Prophet ﷺ to Medina. And the basic discussion is about the events of Battle of Badr. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has narrated the whole events commenting discussing relating and explaining the events to the muslims of that period and for all of us also now before we go through the verses of the sura i would uh, want to narrate the events briefly because then it would be definitely much easy to understand the message of all the verses of the sura regarding the battle of badr what we need to do or we need to know is that when the muslims were in makkah they were they were stopped from any form of fighting and reacting as allah had said kuffu aidiyakum and this was because of obvious reasons because to start with they were few in number they were less in strength and uh, they were new converts and their faith and belief was obviously not that strong and moreover they were residing in the city of the enemy and uh, if allah wanted to allah also wanted to try them and put them into trial by all the persecutions and by all the hardships how patient they can be so now when prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam immigrated to medina and an islamic state was established then in the first year after the immigration allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first allowed and then in the second year they were ordered to do qital that is fight the enemies and then at the same time a complete charter of the mannerism and of uh, all the conduct of qital and jihad was also mentioned in the quran at the same time now the immediate reason for triggering the battle of badr was basically that the leader of us hazrat sa'd bin maaz radhiyallahu ta'ala and who he went to makkah for performing umrah and there when abu jahl saw him all in an ihram he stopped him and he said that you people of medina you give shelter and you protect and support our religious rebels and then you think that you can come along to makkah and you can perform your umrah peacefully so you are wrong believe you me that i will not let you perform umrah hazrat sa'd radhiyallahu ta'ala anhu was very agitated at the aggressive behavior of hazrat of abu jahl and uh, he himself was a leader so in a similar aggressive and a confident manner he answered and he in fact threatened abu jahl and he said that look if you people stop us from what we love and what we desire then remember we shall also stop you from what you people you people of makkah you love and you desire this was what this was a sort of a threat because uh, all the trade caravans of the people of makkah they used to pass by medina so these words of the leader of us meant actually what that the muslims of medina will be attacking the trade caravans of people of makkah now exactly in the same days abu sufyan was returning with a, a trade caravan in which there was Uh, there was the capital of all the traders of makkah and the caravan had just like about 30 to 40 guards and um, it had it had uh, money and commodities worth thousands of dirhams now when 
he heard Abu Sufyan when he heard the threat of uh, Hazasad bin Maz, he felt extremely insecure. So what he did was that he arranged a very, very fast Arabic stallion, a very fast horse and a messenger who was an expert rider. And the rider rode ahead of the caravan and quickly reached Mecca. Outside the city, he tore his shirt, he cut the ears of the animal, and he entered the city crying for help to save the trade caravan, which was, according to him, in the range of the swords and the arrows of the Muslims of Madeira. Getting this news, Abu Jahil, who was already wanting to find an excuse or any other reason to attack Medina, he announced for the preparation of an army and very soon an army of 1,000 was prepared and they left Mecca to save and to protect their trade caravan. Now, Prophet ﷺ was given the news of the advancing army uh, in a revolution and he gathered his companions for consulting, for getting their advice and consulting them what to do. Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had given two options. And the two options were also given with a promise of victory in either. Allah had given an option that if the Muslims wanted, they could attack the trade caravan and uh, acquire the wealth and all. Or if they wanted, they could uh, courageously fight Abu Jahil's army. Prophet Sallallahu uh, told both the options and asked them what they wanted. The answers of the companions were very, very iman boosting. And the leaders from the emigrants of Mecca and the leaders, leaders of uh, the people of Medina, they came out with answers of total obedience and they were prepared to do whatever and wherever Prophet Sallallahu ordered them to fight. And uh, they were total, they were totally submissioned. They were totally submitting and they were totally obedient. And they um, requested Prophet Sallallahu to decide wherever he wanted to go and do whatever he wanted to do and that they will be uh, accompanying him and they will be obeying him. So this love of the Prophet Sallallahu and this manner of obedience that was desired, and uh, this is how they needed to support and they needed to protect Prophet Sallallahu So hearing the uh, answers, of the companions, Prophet ﷺ, he felt very elevated and he ordered the preparation of an army. So with, uh, with an army of 313 obedient companions, the, uh, the army left Medina and uh, if we compare, if we compare, there's no comparison of the two armies of the two uh, armies. The enemy's army were, were, were of uh, 1,000 and the Muslim army was 313 people. The Muslims, they had only 60 armors where the enemy had 600 armors and the Muslims had only 60 animals to ride. And uh, even so that the riding animals were shared in the companions. Even Prophet ﷺ, who was the chief of the army, also shared his ride with Hazrat Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu and Hazrat Mirshad bin Abi Mirshad radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And what happened was that Hazrat Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he requested Prophet ﷺ that um, they should not uh, share the ride and that Prophet ﷺ should take the turn of the two of them also and they could walk. But Prophet ﷺ answered that Ali Neither you are stronger than me, nor are you more strong-willed than me, and nor am I less desirous of Jannah than you. So I want to share the ride with both of you. And the ride was shared. This is a message of ultimate degree of equality and justice and humbleness from Prophet Sallallahu Now the army marched and reached Badr before the Makkan army had reached there, because obviously uh, the grounds of Badr, they were much closer to Medina as compared to Makkah. And the ground of uh, this place was known as Badr because in this place, there were many deep wells and the deep wells, they had clean and stagnant water 
And what happened on the white days was, white days of the month, when the shadow of the moon was casted in the wells, it seemed as if the moon had actually descended or had fallen in the wells. And the full moon in Arabic is known as Badr. So reference to this, the area was known as the field or land of Badr. Now reaching Badr, the next decision was where should the Muslim army camp? And they uh, fixed over their camps. Now Hazrat Hadad radiallahu ta'ala and who he suggested that the relatively raised sandy part of the land be taken as the area for the Muslim encampment and the small army of the Muslim when they had done, when they had done what they were ordered. So till now, if you realize how had the Muslim uh, group behaved, they had obeyed the orders of Allah and Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, and they had patiently carried on in their obedience and they had relied on the promise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what happens when any group of Muslims, they obey, stay patient and rely on the promise of Allah, that what happens, the rule of Allah for such people, for such patient, obedient, reliant people is in Allah ma'aswabirin. In Allah, you have Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for whom the patient people are his beloved. He helps them. So all what the Muslim army had to do was to put up their camps and to stick up to the decision of jihad and battle. But then the help of Allah started coming for them. The first help was that it rained. And this rain turned out to be a remarkable blessing for them in multiple forms. Because firstly, you know, rain is a blessing of Allah. And it had multifold effects on the Muslim army. The first thing was that some of the Muslims and the companions, they were worried. And they had doubts whether the help of Allah and victory will come or not. And Shaitan was also suggesting such thoughts and such um, confusions and worries for them. But when it rained, they felt relaxed. They felt relaxed that this raining indicates what? That the blessing and the help of Allah is with them. Secondly, they all took bath and they cleaned up and they freshed up and they purified and they, they gained energy and strength. And then after purifying and cleaning up, not only did they feel refreshed, but they also offered their salah, they recited their Quran. And this was a source of peace of mind and sakina for them. And this was a source to uh, relieve all forms of stress and anxieties or any confusions or any doubts which were arising in their minds. And then they also <clears throat> gathered and they collected a store or reservoir of water. And uh, uh, the, another thing which was helpful in the form of rain was that the sandy ground on which they had uh, put their camps. Now, initially, it was difficult to walk on the sandy ground. But now after the rain, the sandy ground became firm and it became easy for them to walk. But on the other land, the muddy part of the land where the enemies were supposed to come, it had become slippery because of slush, and uh, it was difficult for them to walk on that part of the land. And there were other means in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also helped them later on, like um, we learned that the sun was shining brightly, and this was at the back of the Muslim army, but in the front, <coughs> but facing and in the front of the enemy. So with the glare, glare of the sun, it caused the advancing armies blinding. It caused them to be blinded out by the light of the sun. Now, similarly, when the enemy was advancing, Prophet Sallallahu picked up a handful of sand and he threw it saying, Shahatil Wuju. And the wind blew with the order of Allah, the wind blew towards the enemy and the sand, it entered the eyes of the soldiers of the enemy, thus blinding them again. Then they received the help of Allah with the, they were deserving of, and uh, the night of, uh, they were also uh, angels which were descended by the order of Allah. 
and they were helping the Muslims in all the battlefield also. And we will be reading all this in the verses of uh, the Surah soon, inshallah. Now, the night, the night of the Battle of Badr was the night of 17 Ramadanul Mubarak. And the two armies, their behaviors and their activities were like 180 degrees opposite. The army of the people of Mecca and of the disbelievers, we we relate and we learn from history that from the army chief down to the line of the soldiers, they were all drinking and dancing, listening to music with bodies, vulgar bodies of the dancing maids trying to please them and serve them wine. And by midnight, all the army drunk, lying scattered all around. But the camps of the companions they were a sight to be seen. Few of them standing in Salah, Raku, Qayyam, crying out for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's help. Some begging for victory in prostration. Some reciting the verses of Quran and crying out for help. Some weeping and supplicating. And the whole army was seeking forgiveness and praying for help. And finally, they all, all the companions and all the army, they finally retired, but the army chief, but the army's chief was still up. He could not sleep in his camp, which has been called as Arish. He was awake, facing the Qibla, raising his hands, crying out, supplicating and asking for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's help, tears rolling down his cheek, beard wet with his tears. And all of them had slept, but one could not. He was whom? He was the friend, the companion of the cave, Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq, and who, who was continuously observing Prophet Wasallam, praying and supplicating. And Prophet Wasallam's words were, Oh Allah, these are the people of Quraysh who have come in their arrogance to prove the falsehood of your Prophet. O Allah, these are a handful of my sincere companions. If this group of my companions perishes, then there will be no one on the earth to remember your name. O Allah, send us your help and destroy the enemies tomorrow. Prophet Sallallahu was crying and sobbing and supplicating and Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala and who said, Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, you have reached the ultimate limit of supplication and crying. And then Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam placed his hand over Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq's hand and he said, Abu Bakr, receive the good news, receive the good tidings. Jibreel alayhi salam has arrived. Promise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has been fulfilled. Supplications have been answered. Angels have arrived in rows. Subhanallah. Subhanallah. We need to learn why was this supplication answered and why was this supplication granted? No doubt is what it was the supplication of the beloved of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but the manner of supplication is what we need to learn and what we need to relate. This was made sincerely. It was made with a deep, sincere heart. And Prophet Sallallahu had cried out sincerely while he was supplicating. And the, the, the most thing, the thing which led to the acceptance of the supplication most of all was that Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had presented, he had presented his most valuable companions also. Today we, we pray for the Ummah, but the, but the supplications, they go unanswered. What we need to do is we need to present, we need to present and spend in the path of Allah are valuable, beloved belongings, and then supplications will be heard and granted, inshallah. Now, this was the night of 17th Ramadan. 
And then on the morning of 17th Ramazan, the battle, it started with, as we learn the word of Mubadrat, that is the one-to-one -one combat. And to start with, three tall, strong, brave, well-built fighters, they came in front of the Meccan army and they were Utba bin Rabia, Shiva bin Rabia, Walid bin Utba, and they very aggressively challenged the Muslims that somebody comes out of the Muslim army to face them and fight them one-to-one. -one. Who went out? Who went out at the start to face these three warriors? Just imagine two teenager boys, Ma'uz and Ma'az, radiallahu ta'ala anhuma, two teenagers, youthful boys. By the way, do you know whose sons they were? And you know, it is so heartbreaking for me today that we, we Muslims, we know the names of Mother Teresa and we know Lady Diana, but we Muslims, we do not know the name of this lady who was the mother of Hazrat Ma'ud and Hazrat Ma'az. And let me tell you, this was a companion, a Sahabia of Prophet Sallallahu who had presented seven sons in the first battlefield, four sons of her deceased husband and three sons of her present husband, Hazrat Abdullah bin Ravaha radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And she had become, in this battle of Badr, she had become the mother of three martyrs and four warriors. Who was this? Hazrat Ifra radiallahu ta'ala anha. And when the two youngsters, they stood up courageously in front of the three Meccan soldiers, the disbelievers, they asked them to go back because they did not feel like chopping a mother, a mother, two sons of a mother. And uh, they asked that some adults being sent instead to face them and fight them. Prophet Sallallahu called back Hazrat Ma'uz and Naz, and then Hazrat Ali, Hazrat Hamza, and Hazrat Ubaida bin Haris, they, they went and they killed their opponents. And Hazrat Ubaida, who was seriously injured, and when Prophet Sallallahu visited him, he said that Prophet Sallallahu I was not martyred. And Prophet Sallallahu said, and he reassured and consoled him that I witness that you are a martyr. And then the war started. But when the war started, Hazrat Ma'uz and Hazrat Ma'az, who had been called back, and they were very upset because of that, now they were targeting for something even higher. And uh, they, they met their uncle, Hazrat Abdul Rahman bin Af, and they asked him where Abu Jahl was. So this was now their ne next target. They were asking where Abu Jahl was. And the uncle, at first, he snubbed them that they were too small. But then they were insistent and then finally, Hazrat um, Abdul Rahman bin Auf, he pointed towards a, a white Arabic stallion on which Abu Jahal was riding. And they quickly, they quickly ran towards him. And obviously they couldn't reach him, but they just clung to his legs, trying to pull him down. And in the whole process, the guards, they attacked and they cut Hazrat Maaz's arms to leave it hanging by the side, attached to the body with just a, a fine string of the skin. And despite grievous, grievous injuries, Hazrat Ma'az, radiallahu ta'ala, and who he continued, he continued his efforts with Abu Jahl. And the army, and the army was continuously attacking them. And his arm was dangling around the side and it was causing hindrance their mother, they, their mother had told them that while you are protecting Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, then you, you, you remove all forms of hindrances which come in your path. So what he did was he put his hand, he put his foot on his hand and he pulled off the arm and he threw it away. 
because this was a source of distraction while he was attacking Abu Jahl. And uh, in the process, Hazrat uh, Ma'uz was martyred in the whole process, but both of them, they did succeed in what they had targeted, that they were successful in pulling down Abu Jahl from, from his horse. And Abu Jahl injured, he fell on the ground. And then Hazrat Abdullah bin Masood radiallahu ta'ala who came and he raised his sword to cut off his head. But before he, he was beheaded, Abu Jahl said, woe to me, I am, I have been so humiliated that I'm being killed by young sons of, of the shepherds. And you, and you, he addressed Hazrat Abdullah bin Masood radiallahu ta'ala and who, and you, you know, when you cut my head, cut my neck lower down so that when people see my head, they will say that the, that the neck of the leader of Quraysh was very long. This was what? This was, this was arrogance. This was sheer and ultimate and up, absolute arrogance in the manner of Abu Jahl. And it was this arrogance which had prevented him from accepting Islam and faith on Prophet Wasallam, despite the fact that he was, he was literate and he was one of the very few learned ones in Mecca. And despite the fact that he was the person who had, who had learned the all the events from the from Prophet Sallallahu directing himself, and he was the first one to hear of all the events of the night of Miraj. But still, it was his arrogance which had prevented him from accepting faith and accepting Islam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, help us all remove any form of arrogance in our hearts and help us stay as humble servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, when the uh, head of Abu Jahl was presented, the arrogant leader was presented before Prophet sallallahu he immediately humbly thanked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the help and for the victory which he had blessed them. And uh, he acknowledged that without Allah's help, they could not have achieved all this. Now, the Muslims, no doubt, they had fought courageously. And uh, there are many events like Hazrat Zubair bin Awam, who he was fighting gallantly and he was killing the soldiers of the enemy and he had a spear and he would cut through the skulls. And finally, the head of the spear, it turned and Prophet Sallallahu took it from him and uh, he kept it with himself and he named it Anza. And you know what? When Pakistan was launching its first nuclear missile, it was named as Anza missile. Similarly, Hazrat Uqasha bin Mahsun, who he was um, killing the enemies and his sword was broken. And then he came to Prophet Sallallahu explaining the issue that he doesn't have a sword any longer. So Prophet Sallallahu gave him a branch of the palm tree. And when Prophet Sallallahu handed it over to Hazrat Uqasha, it miraculously became a sword. And then there was uh, the event of the martyrdom of uh, Umar bin Hamam, when Prophet ﷺ was going around and uh, he was announcing, he was calling out to all the Muslims that the one who fights bravely and stays steadfast, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bless him with Jannah. And he was reciting the verses of Surah Al Imran. Sari wila maghfira timir wabi kum wajanatin arzu has sama wati wal ard right that lil muttakin. Hazrat Umair Razi Allah ta'ala anu, when he was listening to the recitation of these verses by Prophet Sallallahu he was saying, Subhanallah, Subhanallah. And Prophet Sallallahu said that he gave him the tidings of Jannah. And he was so happy that he was sitting with his friends with dates in his hand and he put the dates there and he ran towards the battlefield and immediately his friend called him called him from behind that eat your dates before you go then he called back and he answered no now i will go to jana and eat my dates there so in the battle of of badr the companions they had clearly they had very clearly proved that their priorities were in the lives 
in their priorities were that the love of Allah and the love of Prophet was definitely more than the love of their near and dear ones, their relatives of kin. Like we come across so many iman boosting manners of the companions. Hazrat Musa bin Umair was who he was the flag bearer of the Muslim army. And the two of his brothers, who were still non believers, they had joined the uh, army of the Quraysh. And uh, Hazrat Musa bin Umair, he killed one of his brothers, Ubaid bin Umair, who was the eldest. And then, uh, when after the battle was over, he saw a Muslim companion tie his second brother, Abu Aziz bin Umair. And uh, Hazrat Musa bin Umair loudly called to his Muslim companion that uh, tie him up tightly tie him up tightly and secure him so that he might not escape because you know his mother is very rich and she will give a lot of ransom money to the muslims and his brother called out and he said that is this muslim more of a brother to you is he closer to you than me and hazrat musa bin umair said yes today he is similarly hazrat hazrat abu ubaidah bin jarrah radiyallahu ta'ala anhu when he had embraced Islam, his father had tried to, he, his father had tried his level best to revert him to Islam and uh, revert him from Islam and revert him to his uh, ancestral religion. But he had stayed steadfast. Now in the battlefield, his father was in the army of Quraysh. And uh, when Hazrat Abu Ubaidah bin Jarrah, he was fighting in the battlefield, his father faced him twice. And uh, he turned his direction. But when the father came in front of him for the third time, and he tried to prevent his advance in the roles of the enemy, then Hazrat Abu Baida bin Jarrah, he raised his sword and with his own hand, he cut the body of his father in two halves. Similarly, Hazrat Umar radiallahu ta'ala and who, and uh, for, for Hazrat Ubaidah bin uh, Jarrah, Prophet Sallallahu had said that for every ummah there is a trustworthy companion and the trustworthy of my ummah is abu ubaidah bin jarrah and hazrat umar radiyallahu ta'ala anhu he had killed his maternal uncle as bin hajim who was the brother of abu jahl and uh, similarly hazrat abu bakr siddiq radiyallahu ta'ala anhu his uh, son he was attacked by the father also so when they had fought so courageously out of the sincere love and obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the help of Allah came and the angels were sent down for their help and they were blessed with a remarkable victory. 70, 70 of the enemy were killed. They were mostly the eminent leaders and 70 were taken prisoners. So the basic lesson and the moral of the events of the Battle of Badr is that it is not the number. It is not the number, the strength, or the arms and ammunition of the army which is important. What is important is, and what is needed is, the behavior and the mannerism. Remember when a group of Muslims, when a group of Muslims, however, few and however weak and however empty handed they are when they when they are obedient to Allah and Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and they stay patient in their obedience and they rely on the promises of Allah then Allah's help Allah's help befalls on them Allah's mercy and blessings accompany them and the rule of Allah, inna Allah ma'aswabirin, comes into action. So if we want, as an ummah, as a Muslim state, as the Muslim community, that we receive the help and blessings and mercies of Allah, then what do we need to do? We need to replicate the behavior and the mannerism of the people in the battle of Badr by the companions of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Verse number one. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Yas Alunaka Anil Anfal. 
Kulil anfalu lillahi war rasuli. Fattakullaha wa aslihu zata baynikum. Wa atiyullaha wa rasulahu in kuntum mu'minin. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, They ask you, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, about the bounties of war. Say, the decision concerning the bounties is for Allah and the messenger. You do what? You fear Allah and amend that is between you and obey Allah and his messengers if you should be believers. So in this verse number one, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioning about al-anfal. Anfal is the plural of nafal. Nafal means what? In Arabic, it means extra on top of, beyond the necessary or obligatory. So it refers to what? It refers to the booty of, or the bounties of the battlefield. Because you know why? Why is it called as anfal? Is that the purpose of battle by the Muslim, by the mujahideen or by the Muslims is not to get the booty itself, but is what the mujahideen sought by all these activities, the player of Allah and the reward of his Jannah. And the booty is what? It is something on top of that. It is something beyond that. And it is what? It is something extra. So the question of the booty arose when after the Battle of Badr, the Muslims got a huge amount of booty. And till now, there were no orders of Quran regarding the booty. Nothing had been revealed. So they inquired from Prophet ﷺ regarding the division, how it will be divided and to whom it will be given. So they were instructed that instead of bothering about the division of the booty, they needed to do three things. And these three, three things which were suggested were what would they, they would protect them from the malice of wealth. That obviously because you, you're going to receive a lot of wealth and you, you've received a lot of booty and wealth itself is what? So rather than indulging in the malice of wealth, in the love and the lust of the wealth, to save yourself from all that, you do three things. Number one, fear Allah, that is piety. Number two, to make amendments and improvements in your mutual relations with your relations of kin and Last but not the least, do what? Atiullah wa atiul rasul. Obey Allah and obey Prophet ﷺ, provided you are what? In kuntum mu'minin, if you are the believers. And then in the verse number two to four, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells and highlights the traits and manners of the believers. Allah says the believers are only those who, when Allah is mentioned, their hearts become fearful. And when his verses are re recited to them, it increases them in faith. And upon their Lord, they rely. The ones who established prayers and from what we have provided them, they spend. Those are the believers truly. For them are the degrees of high position with their Lord and forgiveness and noble provisions. Verse number five, it is just as when your Lord brought you out of your home for the battle of Badr in truth, while indeed a party among the believers was unwilling. Who were these? The hypocrites of Medina. Arguing with you concerning the truth after it had become clear as if they were being driven towards death while they were looking on. Verse 7, remember, O believers, when Allah promised you one of the two groups. Which two groups? One was the trade caravan, which was led by Abu Sufyan, and the other was the army of the Quraysh, led by whom? By Abu Jahl. One of the two groups, that it would be yours. That is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had mentioned and promised victory that it would be yours. And you wished that the unarmed one, which one? The trade caravan carrying 
so so much of wealth with them and obviously was hardly guided by like 30 to 40 guards so you wished that the unarmed one would be yours but allah intended to establish the truth by his words and to eliminate the disbelievers here allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions what was easier for the people to fight Verse number eight, that he should establish the truth and abol abolish the falsehood, even if the criminals disliked it. So in this verse seven and eight, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioning the words of that is the unarmed group. And this was what this was the trade caravan of Abu Sufyan. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted and he ensured that there would be a combat between the Muslim army and Abu Jahl's army. Why? So that the power and the supremacy of the Muslim army be proven and uh, it be highlighted to all the people of Arab. So that is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted the battle to be taken. Verse number nine, remember when you asked help of your Lord. And he answered you, indeed, I will reinforce you with a thousand from the angels following one another. Prophet ﷺ in the camp in Irish was supplicating and asking for help. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had uh, promised that there will be a reinforcement with a thousand of angels. Why was the number of thousand mentioned? Because obviously the news had reached them that the army of Quraysh and Abu Jahl was what? Was uh, of about like thousand soldiers. So it was to reassure them, to console them, and to give them the idea of what support is going to be extended to them as Allah is mentioning them victory also. And Allah made it not but good tidings, and so that your hearts would be assured thereby. And victory is not but from Allah. Indeed, Allah is exalted in might and wise. Verse 11, remember when he overwhelmed you with the drowsiness, giving security from him and sent down upon you from the sky rain by which to purify you and remove you from the evil suggestions of shaitan and to make steadfast your heart and plant firmly thereby your feet. So now we understand uh, as I've already explained, how the rainfall was helpful, for, uh, the rainfall was helpful and supportive for them. Verse 12, remember when your Lord inspired to the angels, I am with you. So strengthen those who have believed. I will cast terror into the hearts of those who disbelieved. So strike them upon the necks and strike from them every fingertip. So if you read this verse, while I'm reading the words, it creates an impression. It creates an impression as if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took, took over the battle for the Muslim armies. Allah took over the battle and Allah got the angels, his companions to take over the battle. And Muslims are like just standing as, as figures and Allah and angels are fighting the battle for them. That is, Allah explains that Allah took over the battle and the angels came out for the support. Why? That is because they opposed Allah, who? The Quraysh of Mecca. They opposed Allah and his messenger and whoever opposes Allah and his messenger. Indeed, Allah is severe in penalty. <coughs> <coughs> That is yours. So taste it. And indeed, for disbelievers is the punishment of fire. Oh, you who have believed when you meet those who disbelieve advancing for the vettel, do not do not turn to them your backs in flight. So now, after discussing how the help of Allah had come, for the people in the battle of Badr. Now Allah here is talking about future instructions to all the Muslim armies and the fighters that never ever retreat or turn back in the battlefield. Because other than two situations, which Allah is explaining in the next verse, and whoever turns his back to them on such a day, unless 
swerving as a strategy for war or joining another company has certainly returned with anger upon him from Allah and his refuge is hell and wretched is the destination. So Allah is telling them that you have seen how Allah helped the companions in the battle of Badr. And if you stay obedient and if you stay reliant and patient and you, you repeat the mannerism which was exhibited and demonstrated by the people of, uh, by the companions of Prophet Sallallahu then similarly, you will also get the support and help and victory from Allah. And so do not retreat from the battlefield except in two situations. The two situations which have been explained in verse 16 are that when the Muslim or when the army retreats with the planning of a military tactics, or when the retreat is meant to join another army which is coming from behind to attack with a greater strength and with a greater number. Prophet Sallallahu has been reported in a tradition of Muslim that he said, that save yourself or stay away from mobikat seven destructive deeds avoid or stray stay away from seven destructive deeds these are what polytheism to kill an innocent person Asihar, that is magic, riba, that is interest or usury, and consuming the wealth of an orphan or to run away from the battlefield. And seventh is to accuse chaste women, modest women of adultery. So these are all major sins which have been labeled as mubiqat by Prophet Sallallahu And one out of them is what? Retreating or running away from the battlefields. Verse 17, and you did not kill them, but it was Allah who killed them. And you threw not when you threw, but it was Allah who threw that. He might test the believers with a good test. Indeed, Allah is hearing and knowing. Now, what happened during the Battle of Badr was that 70, 70, 70 of the kafirs, the disbelievers were killed. And the Muslims, they had a magnificent victory. Now, there were chances that some of the Muslims, they might get arrogant and they might start feeling overconfident and they might start depending on their own power and their skill rather than relying and depending on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So to prevent even the traces of arrogance, so to prevent even the minutest of traces of arrogance, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told them that whatever had turned out to be the factors of victory were all the orders and they were with the will and with the power and with the authority of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who just had intended and ordered to help and support the Muslims. That is so and also that Allah will weaken the plot of the disbelievers. If you disbelievers seek the victory, the defeat has come to you. And if you desist from hostilities, it is best for you. But if you return to war, we will return. And never will you be availed by your, by your large company at all even if it should increase, that is because Allah is with the believers. And you have, and you who have believed, believe and obey Allah and his messenger and do not turn from him while you hear his orders and do not be like those who say, we have heard while they do not hear. Indeed, the worst of living creatures in the sight of Allah are the deaf and dumb who do not use reason. Had Allah known any good in them, he would have made them hear. And if he had made them hear, they would have still turned away while they were refusing. O oh, you who have believed, respond to Allah and to the messenger when he calls you to that which gives you life. And know that Allah intervenes between a man and his heart, and that to him you will be gathered. And fear a trial which will not strike those who have wronged among you exclusively, and know that Allah is severe in penalty. 
verse number 26. And remember when you were few and oppressed in the land, fearing that people might abduct you, but he sheltered you, supported you with his victory and provided you with good things that you might be grateful. Now, who is Allah mentioning that they were few and they were oppressed in the land? This is the Muslims in Makkah. Before the emigration of Muslims from Makkah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioning how few they were, how oppressed and persecuted they were, and how fear what fear they had that they might be abducted but then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala helped them and they migrated to Medina and there Allah gave them the support Allah gave them the shelter and now this victory of Yawmul Furqan or the battle of Badr verse number 27 O oh, you who have believed do not betray Allah since Allah has helped you supported you provided you with shelter and now this victory so now in future do not do what do not betray Allah and the messenger or betray your trust while you while you know the consequence and now that your properties and, uh, and know that your properties and your children are but a trial and that Allah has with him a great reward. Verse number 29, O you who have believed, if you fear Allah, he will grant you a criteria and will remove from you your misdeeds and forgive you. And Allah is the possessor of great bounty. Now this verse explains Three wonderful outcomes, three wonderful outcomes of piety or the fear of Allah. Piety results in what? Yaj'allakum furqana. A person gets what? A person who is God fearing, he finds it. He finds it easy to differentiate between the right and the wrong, the truth and the false, the lawful and the unlawful, the do's and the don'ts, the righteous deeds and the sinful deeds. So the person finds it easy to differentiate between all these things. The second is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala purifies the God-fearing uh, God person's sins and evil deeds and makes righteous deeds easy for the person. And third, Allah, for, Allah forgives the pious and the God-fearing. So these are the three rewards which a bondsman will receive if he stays. How? Stays in a state of fear of Allah or in a state of piety. Allahumma aati nafsi taqwaha. Allahumma inni as'aluka al-khuda wal-tuqa wal-afafa wal-ghina. Verse number 30. And remember when those who disbelieve plotted against you to restrain you or kill you or evict you from Makkah, but they plan and Allah plans and Allah is the blessed, best of planners. When and where and who did all this planning was that before the immigration of Prophet wasallam from Medina, from Makkah, the teachings of Prophet Sallallahu they were spreading rapidly. So the leaders of Quraysh, they gathered together and in Darul Nadwa, they started planning how to put an end to all this, how to put an end to the spreading of this religion to prevent and to protect their ancestral religion of Ibrahim Islam as they thought it was. Now, there were different suggestions which were floated. Some suggested that just restrain Prophet Sallallahu But they were, the others negated saying that if you seize him, his fanatic companions, they would attack and they will, uh, they will free him away. And then the second was to evict Prophet Sallallahu and to turn him out of Makkah. And these were also opposed by others saying that you must be like out of your mind to suggest something like that. The religion is spreading despite the fact that they are very much under our control and our supervision. Now, if you let them out and if you let them go out of Makkah, then it will spread like a jungle fire. And then the third suggestion was to <coughs> the third suggestion was to kill him or assassinate him. And they said that if you do so, then all the relatives and all the companions, they will 
uh, they will uh, claim the blood money and then what will you do? So these were the suggestions and they were trying to plan, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, makaru wa makarullah. Allah, Allah was the best planner. And when our verses are recited to them, they say, we have heard, if we willed, we could say something like this. This is not, but legends of the former people. Verse 32, and remember when they said, oh Allah, who said the Quraysh of Makkah, they said this, oh Allah, if this should be the truth from you, then rain down upon us stones from the sky or bring us a painful punishment. Now here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is explaining the words of the people and the leaders of Makkah when they were departing for the battle. Abu Jahl, we learn that he held to the covers of Haram and he asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that if the Quraysh were not at the truth, that if the Quraysh were on the falsehood, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you rain stone on all of us. What was this all about? Actually, you know what? The polytheists of Makkah, they thought that they were following the religion of Ibrahim alayhi salam. And they were, as they thought, and they perceived that they were on the right path. And that Prophet wasallam was actually deviating from their ancestral religion and he was on the falsehood. So that is why they opposed Prophet wasallam. You know what? This was all a trick of shaitan. He had made them believe all this and to justify and this was why to justify that refusal of Prophet Sallallahu and being enemies with him is actually was actually what? It was a religious duty which Quraysh were performing. This is shaitan. And this is how shaitan makes people commit such major sins, such major sins, and still make the person think that he is doing a righteous deed. But Allah would not punish them while, till when? Allah would not punish them while you, O Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, are among them. And Allah would not punish them while they seek forgiveness. So now in this verse 33, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala explains his rule of punishing a nation. Punishing a nation, till when doesn't Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala punish a nation? We gather that Allah does not punish a nation till they, there are two situations or two conditions. The first is that when the prophet is among them, as we learn from the stories of the previous nations, the perished nations, the punished nations of the prophets, that as long as among them was the prophet, they were not punished. And when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decided to punish them, the prophet was ordered to leave his people and emigrate. And after that, the torment struck the people. For example, the people of Ad, people of Samud, people of the nation of Lut. All of the stories we learn from Surah Hud, they clearly explain to us that the Prophet was ordered to emigrate and leave the people behind. And then the torment and punishment of Allah fell upon the nation. The second rule of Allah is, that Allah does not punish them till when? Till the people of the nation are seeking forgiveness. That is, till the condition when they are realizing and they are admitting their disobedience and their transgression, and they realize that they need to reform and improve themselves. So till there is a hope and there is a response of reformation and er eradication of sin, they are spared. But when a nation collectively gives up seeking, collectively or individually, gives up seeking forgiveness and their seems absolutely no hope of their reformation and eradication of their evil deeds, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends down his punishment and his torments. So the lesson learned is today, when crises and calamities are continuously striking the ummah, 
And as punishments and trials, they are coming as jolting signs from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if we need to escape, if we want and if we desire to escape from all these crises and calamities and torments, what do we need to do? At individual levels and at collective levels, self-analysis, self, a strict self-analysis followed by acceptance, confession, seeking forgiveness, followed by a planning and promising, eradicating, reformation, and a desire of improvement. So this is what we need to do as an ummah or at our individual levels also. Allahumma ja'alni min al-tawwabina wa ja'alni min al-mutatakhirin. Rabbi ghfir warham wa anta khayru rahimin. اللهم اغفر لنا وللمؤمنين والمؤمنات والمسلمين والمسلمات. But why should Allah not punish them while they obstruct people from Al Masjid Al Haram and they were not fit to be its guardians? Its true guardians are not but the righteous, but most of them do not know. And that, and their prayers at the house was not except whistling and hand clapping. So taste the punishment for what you disbelieved. Indeed, those who disbelieve and spend their wealth to avert people from the way of Allah, so they will spend it. Then will, uh, then it will be for them a source of regret. Then they will, they will not. Uh, then, and then they will be overcome. And those who have disbelieved unto hell, they will be gathered. Allahumma ajirna minan nar. This is so that Allah may distinguish the wicked from the good and place the wicked, some of them, upon the others and heap them up all together and put them in hell. It is those who are the losers. Allahumma la taj'alna minhum. Say to those who have disbelieved that if they cease, what has previously occurred will be forgiven for them. But if they return to hostility, then the precedent of the former rebellious people has already taken place. Verse number 39, and fight them until there is no fitna and until the religion, all of it is for Allah. And if they cease, then indeed Allah is seeing of what they do. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here is instructing a conduct of war by the Muslim army because the purpose and intention of war by the Muslims should be what? Hatta la taqunu fitna. The battle or the war by the Muslim army should continue till there is finishing off or there is eradication of fitna. And corruption. So the so the uh, the words it indicates that the purpose of war by the Muslims is to put an end to all forms of corruption and fitna. And when the enemy stays away from fitna, and there is then no reason for the Muslim army to attack or to fight the armies or the enemies then. But if they turn away, they know that Allah is your protector. Excellent is the protector and excellent is the helper. Hasbi Allah, la ilaha illahu alayhi tawakkaltu wa huwa rabbul arshil azim. Verse 41, and know that anything you obtain of the war booty, then indeed for Allah is one fifth of it. And for the messenger and for his near relatives and orphans, the needy and the stranded traveler, if you have believed in Allah and in that which we send down to our servant on the day, the day when the two armies met and Allah over all things is competent. <coughs> so in this verse number 41, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is here giving the orders regarding the division of booty. And these orders in the verse of Quran are very brief, whereas the detailed uh, order, the detail of the order we receive from the, from the words of Hadith. One out of five, one out of five, that is the one fifth has been given, has been specified out of the total booty 
as a share of Allah and the share of Prophet Sallallahu Allah's share was given to the deprived, is supposed to be given to the have-nots, to the deprived, to the poor, the needy, the orphans of the society. And Prophet Sallallahu share was allocated for the expenditures of the wives of Prophet Sallallahu the Umahatul Mumini. Because the reason was that uh, Prophet Sallallahu had committed himself full time he was full time committed in the work of the religion, in the teaching, in the preaching of religion, in jihad, in all these activities. And he had no time whatsoever to work or to earn for his economic requirements and for the requirements of his family as his livelihood. So this part of uh, <coughs> The half of this one fifth was allocated for the expenditures of the Umahatul Mu'minin and the family of the Prophet. So, if the, there was some superfluous beyond this, then this was also given to the orphans and to the needy relatives of Prophet. Now, the remaining four out of five, this was allocated for the soldiers, the Mujahideen. And the rule was that the soldier or the Mujahid who had joined in the battle with his ride, with his horse, or with his arms, in whichever form, he was given three times the share as compared to the person who had not spent and just had joined the battlefield and just had fought um, without any arms, ammunition, or without any form of ride. And that was only fair. Remember when you were on the near side of the valley and they were on the farther side, who was on the near side of the valley? People who were going, the Muslims, the companions, the Muslim army of 313, which were going from Medina, because I've told you that battle of Badr was much closer to Medina as compared to Makkah. And they were on the farther side. This was what the army of Abu Jahl and the caravan, the caravan of the trade caravan of Abu Sufyan. And the caravan was, or, was lower in the position than you. If you had made an appointment to meet, you would have missed the appointment. But it was so that Allah might accomplish a matter already distinct that those who perish through disbelief would perish upon evidence and those who lived in faith would live upon evidence. And indeed, Allah is hearing and knowing. Remember, O Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, when Allah showed them to you in your dream as few, and if He had shown them to you as many, you believers would have lost courage and would have disputed in the matter of whether to fight. But Allah saved you from that. Indeed, He is knowing of that within your breasts. So here in the verse 43, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is explaining what he did. He did to relax the Muslim soldiers so that they did not get upset or did not get disheartened or lose their heart. Realizing that the army of the enemy was too big for them to face or was too huge and immense for them to fight. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to ensure that the battle between the Muslims and the army of Abu Jahl took place once for all so that he could prove, he could help the Muslims and prove once for all the supremacy of the army and the companions of Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So in the dream of all the Muslim companions, the strength and the number of the army of Abu Jahl was shown as diminished. Verse 44, and remember when he showed them to you when you met as few in your eyes and he made you appear as few in their eyes also so that Allah might accomplish a matter already distant and to Allah are all matters returned. Now, in the previous verse, Allah has explained how the Muslims and their dreams were shown that the army of Abu Jahl is lesser in number so that they don't get disheartened and they don't like retreat or get uh, or run away. Now, in this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has uh, mentioned another thing. The strength and the number of the Makkan army was three times more than the Muslims. And Allah says that, Allah showed the strength of the Muslim army even lesser than 313 to the people of the Quraysh. Why did Allah need to do that? Why did Allah need to show the Muslim army even smaller? They were already one third as compared to the Quraysh army. 
why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala needed to show them even smaller and weaker in the eyes of the Meccans was because, you know, the disbelievers, all the disbelievers, because the lack of faith, because of the lack of faith and belief, they are basically covered at heart. They are covered. So they lose heart very easily. And secondly, the Muslim believers, the Muslims and the Muslim groups, they have a glamour. They have a glamour of their own. And this glamour, it leaves and it creates a terror in the hearts of the opponents. This is the strength of Iman, which, which impresses and which terrifies the Muslim enemies. The people of Makkah, seeing that even they were one third, but knowing how fanatic the companions of Prophet ﷺ were, they, they, and how fanatically they would be prepared to lay down their lives for Prophet ﷺ, they might still have got scared and they might have fled seeing even a power or strength of 330 convicted, sincere companions of Prophet ﷺ, and they might have fled from the battlefield. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to ensure that this event of battle took place. Because why? Because Allah Almighty, Allah Alimul Ghaib, He knew that once the armies face one another, then Allah will for sure will help the Muslims and Allah will fight for the Muslim army. And with His help, the Muslims will come out victorious. And this will prove the falsehood of the people of Makkah and the truthfulness and righteousness of the stance of the Muslims and the supremacy of Prophet as compared to the Quraysh of Makkah. Verse number 45. O you who have believed, when you encounter a company from the enemy forces, stand firm and remember Allah much that you may be successful. So this is also a concluding note, after all the above discussion, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioning, since you've seen, you've learned, you've experienced these manners of Allah, so being aware of the sunnah and of the manner of Allah, now in future, do what? Obey Allah, rely on the promises of Allah, and stay steadfast while facing the armies in future. And obey Allah and his messenger and do not dispute and thus lose courage. And then your strength would depart and be patient. Indeed, Allah is with the patient. Verse 47, and do not be like those who come forth from their homes insolently and to be seen by people and avert them from the way of Allah. And Allah is encompassing of what they do. This is, in this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioning the manner of Abu Jahl and his companions and army. Because what happened was that they were advancing in full arrogance. The army of Abu Jahl, they stopped at 17 places during their journey to Badr. And at each stopover, they would stop, they would slaughter camels, they would eat roasted meat and drink and dance and gamble. And this was all in transgression. And this was all utter and absolute arrogance which was being shown by the people of Makkah. Now, another thing which happened was that uh, since the Muslims, they had not attacked the trade caravan of Abu Sufyan. So on reaching Makkah safely, Abu Sufyan, he sent a messenger to Abu Jahl informing about his safe arrival in Makkah. And he asked Abu Jahl to come back since the purpose of taking the army was basically to protect and to guard the trade caravan against the looting and attacking attacks of the Muslims. But Abu Jahl, in his arrogance, he refused to return. And he told the messenger to tell Abu Sufyan that now that they had a chance, they had a chance and they had started advancing, they have a huge army also, they will attack the city of Medina they will attack the city of Prophet Wasallam, and they would demolish it and they will finish off all the traces of this new religion and all the new followers once for all, finally. This was what? This was arrogance. And what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala highly disapproves and extremely dislikes is arrogance. It's arrogance which he dislikes. 
the sovereign master of master dislikes what? He dislikes arrogance by the people. So the arrogant Abu Jahl and his army was punished, was punished badly, not only teaching them a lesson, but at the same time, the legend of how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala punishes all those who are arrogant and who stay arrogant and prefer to be arrogant. Allahumma la taj'alna minhum. Verse 48. And remember when Shaitan made their deeds pleasing to them and said, Shaitan made whose deeds? The deeds of the people of Makkah and the army of Makkah to them and said, no one, no one can overpower, no one can overcome you today from among the people. And indeed, I am your protector. But when the two armies sighted each other, he turned on his heels and said, Indeed, I am disassociated from you. Indeed, I see what you do not see. What was the what was Shaitan seeing? The angels descend from heavens. Indeed, I fear Allah, and Allah is severe in penalty. What was all this about? We learn from some commentaries and traditions that uh, uh, from the previous verses also that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted that the battle between the Muslims and Abu Jahl's army takes place. So he had planned accordingly. Now, commentaries also suggest that Shaitan also wanted the battle to be fought. Why did Shaitan want that the battle should be fought? Because for Shaitan, he thought that the Muslims were far less in number than the people of Baka. So the outnumbered Muslims, they will be taught a lesson by the Meccan army and Islam and the teachings of Prophet Sallallahu and Quran will perish once for all. And that is what the assumptions of Shaitan seeing the state of affairs of both the armies was. So Shaitan came to Abu Jahl in appearance of Suraka bin Malik. Suraka bin Malik who was the leader of an Arab tribe of uh, Makkah and they were allies to the Quraysh. He came in form of uh, Suraka bin Malik and he re reassured Abu Jahl that he would give them a support in the battle with his army because Shaitan wanted to ensure the happening of the battle. But when Shaitan saw the angels descend from, uh, from the heavens as the help from Allah, then Shaitan retreated. Shows all what? Shaitan is a corrupter. Shaitan and all the promises of Shaitan are what? They are not true. Shaitan is not trustworthy. And all the promises are false. And the trickery of Shaitan is evil and corrupting. Remember when the hypocrites and those in whose hearts was a disease, which disease? Hypocrisy. Their religion has deluded those Muslims, but whoever relies upon Allah, then indeed Allah is exalted in might and wise. If you could but see when the angels take the souls of those who disbelieved, they are striking their faces and their backs and saying, taste the punishment of the burning fire. And that is for what your hands have put forth of evil. And because Allah is not ever unjust to his servants, theirs is like the custom of the people of Pharaoh and of those before them. They disbelieved in the signs of Allah. So Allah sees them for their sins. Indeed, Allah is powerful and severe in penalty. Verse 53, that is, because Allah would not change a favor which he had bestowed upon a people until they change what is within themselves. And indeed, Allah is hearing and knowing. Now, this verse explains a rule of Allah which works both ways. This rule seems to work both ways. That is, firstly, it is only... It is only and only when people disobey or transgress that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala punishes them and they suffer crises and calamities. So we understand what? So the hardships on the people is a torment of Allah because of their misconduct and because of their disobedience and transgressions. Secondly, we learn what? The other way around, that when a nation, because of the anger, 
and because of the wrath of Allah upon them. <coughs> Any nation, because of the anger of Allah, is suffering from the crises and torments. This nation wants to change, wants to change and improve the condition. Then they need to do what? They need to change their behaviors to change their condition, to change the state of affair of crises. People need to change their disobedience to obedience, their transgressions to humble, to humble submission, to humble submissions to the commandments and limits of Allah by confessing, by regretting, by seeking forgiveness and eradicating the sins, the malice, the corruptions and the transgressions. So improving our behaviors, reforming ourselves will lead to eradicate and save us from all the crises and hardships which befall a nation. Theirs is like the custom of the people of Pharaoh and those of before them. They denied the signs of their Lord, so we destroy them for their sins, and we drown the people of Pharaoh, and all of them were wrongdoers. Indeed, the worst of living creatures in the sight of Allah are those who have disbelieved, and they will not ever believe. The ones with whom you made a treaty, but then they break their pledge every time, and they do not fear Allah. So if you, Muhammad وسلم, gain dominance over them in war, disperse them by means of them who's behind them, uh, who's behind them that perhaps they will be remained. And if you have reason to fear from people betrayal, throw their treaty back to them, putting you on equal terms. Indeed, Allah does not like traitors. And let not those who disbelieve think they will escape. Indeed, they will not cause failure to Allah. Verse 60, and prepare against them whatever you are able of power and of steeds of war by which you may terrify the enemy of Allah and your enemy and others besides them whom you do not know, but whom Allah knows. And whatever you spend in the cause of Allah will be fully repaid to you and you will not be wronged. So in this verse number 60, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is now mentioning a future line of action for the Muslims of Ummah in the light of the discussion of the conditions of battle of Badr. In the battle of Badr, with the special blessings and with the ultimate help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, did the Muslims achieve a miraculous, a miraculous and a spectacular victory. But for future, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioning here, but for future, stay prepared. And how stay prepared? Allah has instructed and suggested preparations for war in forms of all the power the Muslim, the Muslims have. And Allah has also suggested preparations of war in forms of horses. Horse being an extremely useful animal, you know, because Horse, horses they were, they had a pivot role in the battle of those days. But even till now, even till now, horses still, they still uh, play a very important role, like carrying goods and uh, rations to all those areas where all these modern vehicles, they cannot reach, like all the mountain and all these areas where the vehicles can't reach, the horses carry all these things. Moreover, horses, they were used in those periods, they were used for carrying and for transferring the army, the soldiers, the ammunitions, the goods, and the mujahideen themselves. So it means what? That for all the periods, the Muslims, they need to prepare for all their warfare technology, which they need in their period for transporting, for translocating uh, arms and animations and all forms of rations and all forms of soldiers may um, even be, uh, it might be the tank carriers, the rocket launchers or the missiles or the missiles carriers. Missiles in these days are what? They are needed for transporting of the nuclear warfare to the enemy sites. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is ordering us to prepare 
and to be mindful and to be sensitive to keep prepared against the enemies and to make preparations and just not rely on the help of Allah. We need to rely in, on the help of Allah after doing all what we can according to our power and according to our own authorities. And this is what reliance actually means for the Muslims. And if they incline to peace, they incline to it also and rely upon Allah. Indeed, it is he who is hearing and the knowing. But if they intend to deceive you, then sufficient for you is Allah. It is he who supported you with his help and with the believers and brought together their hearts. If you had spent all that is in the earth, you could not have brought their hearts together, but Allah brought them together. Indeed, he is exalted in might and wise. O Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, sufficient for you is Allah and for whoever follows you of the believers. Verse number 65. O Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, urge the believers to battle if there are among you 20 who are steadfast, they will overcome 200. That is a ratio of what? One is to one is to 100. So they will overcome 200. And if there are among you 100 who are steadfast, they will overcome a thousand of those who have disbelieved because they are people who do not understand. Now, Allah has lightened the hardship for you and he knows that among you is weakness. So if there are from you 100 who are steadfast, they will overcome 200. And if there are among you a thousand, they will overcome 2000 by the permission of Allah and Allah is with the, those who are steadfast. Now here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is explaining a ratio of Muslims versus the disbelievers. And uh, the companions of the Prophet وسلم, obviously they had a greater strength of Iman. So for them, it was like 10 soldiers among the Muslim companions. Allah said they were strong enough to defeat 100. And for the later periods, as the state of belief weakens as compared to the companions, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has brought down the ratio uh, from 100 is to 200, that is 1 is to 2. That is even now. This means that even now the Muslims, because of the strength of Iman, are strong enough to face, to fight, or to defeat enemy, which is double as compared to their number in power, in strength, in whatever twice as compared to them, Muslims can still manage to defeat them. Verse number 67. <clears throat> it is not for the Prophet وسلم, to have captives of war until he inflicts a massacre upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's enemies in the land. Some Muslims desire the commodities of this world, but Allah desires for you the hereafter, and Allah is exalted in might and wise. If not, for a decree from Allah that preceded you would have been touched for what you took by a great punishment. So now do what? So consume what you have taken of war booty as being lawful and good and fear Allah. Indeed, Allah is forgiving and merciful. In these three verses, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioning about an issue of the captives, the captives of battle of Badr, which we have learned that 70 of the imminent leaders of Quraysh were killed and 70 were taken captives. Now, this was the first occasion when Muslims were dealing with the captives in such a huge number. So this was the first occasion when the Muslims had captives of the disbelievers. Prior to this, in uh, the whole situation, prior to the whole of the situation of Battle of Badr, the Surah Muhammad, which had been revealed in its words, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has had given an option of releasing the captives of war after taking a ransom money. So once there were 70 captives, Prophet Sallallahu uh, consulted his two reliable companions, that is Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq anhu, and Hazrat Umar anhu, to decide as what should be done. Because we know that counseling is an order of Quran. And uh, Prophet Sallallahu uh, every time he needed to decide something, he used to counsel. 
So the suggestions were according to the temperaments of the companions. Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq, who he was extremely soft-hearted and he was kind-natured. And he suggested that ransom money be taken and the captives released, since there was a preceding verse from Surah Muhammad advising that. On the contrary, Hazrat Umar who, who was who was always very aggressive and he was very strong-headed always, he suggested that enemy captives should be dealt with very aggressively and all of them should be beheaded. And he further requested Prophet Sallallahu that the captives should be handed over to him and he would make the Muslim relatives of the captives behead their relatives to correct and to prove the preferences of love of Allah and the Prophet Sallallahu were much more than the love of anything in the world. But to Prophet Sallallahu himself, he was very soft-tempered. So he somehow seemed to approve of Hazrat Abu Bakr's suggestions and the decision was taken of uh, taking ransom and freeing the captives this decision was taken and only two of the captives they were put to sword one of them was Uqba bin Abu uh, Abi Murid. Uh, this was the person who had placed the filth of the she camel on the back of Prophet Sallallahu while he was prostrating and uh, the second was Nazar bin Haris this was the person who had planned to stop and divert the uh, new converts of uh, the Muslims from the teachings of Quran. And he had planned to introduce, with his wicked planning, he had introduced dancing and music and drinking in the lives of the new converts. So these two were beheaded and the rest of all the captives, they were freed and ransom was taken. The ransom was taken in different forms. For some, it was taken in cash or in form of gold and silver. And some, it was, it was fixed as education. All those captives who were literate and who knew how to read and write, their ransom was appointed and fixed by Prophet Wasallam that uh, the captive who was literate, they would teach 10, 10 people of Medina. And when all those 10 Muslims would be able to read and write, then the literate captive would be released. So I would want to stop here to rectify a misconception which is created by all those who try to defame Islam and who try to defame the teachings of Quran, saying that Islam and the teachings of Quran stop the Muslims from worldly education. Quranic teachings deter the followers for seeking the worldly knowledge and skills. Look here. Look at this. Prophet Sallallahu after the battle of Badr, making a ransom of captives, that the captives of Makkah, they will be, they will be teaching, they will be teaching the Muslims of Medina. And obviously, very obviously, the captives of Makkah, they will not be teaching the verses of Quran. They will be teaching what? The worldly reading, writing skills. So Prophet Sallallahu is here trying to improve the literacy rate of Medina because the literacy rate of Medina was very few and there were only very, very few literate people in Medina. How liberal Islam is, how modern Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was, we only get to know, we just need to get to know what we actually don't know. We need to get to close to Quran, to Hadith and Sunnah to know how people are trying to defame all this. When the decision of uh, the ransoms of the captives was finalized after the meeting, then uh, after the counseling, then after a few days, this verse was revealed. And uh, Hazrat Abu Bakr who says that I paid Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam a visit and I saw that he was crying. And he called out to me and he told me that Abu Bakr had it not been that the verse of Surah Muhammad, they, it had been revealed then then we would have both been punished by a torment which was sown to me behind the trunk of that tree. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala disliked the act and uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala approved of the suggestion of Hazrat Umar radiallahu ta'ala and who here. Now talking about the captives, I will also want to share another event. Hazrat uh, Amr ibn Ulas, he was the son-in-law of Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa uh, his daughter has a Zainab and has son. 
uh, his uh, her husband. He was still a non-Muslim. He had not converted to Islam. And he had accompanied the army of Abu Jahl, and then he was taken as a captive. When asked for ransom, his wife, daughter of uh, Prophet Sallallahu had sent her necklace. And this necklace was the one which her mother, that is Hazrat Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha, had given to her at the time of her nikah. Now, Prophet Sallallahu was sitting among his companions and he saw this necklace, which was given as a ransom for Amr ibn Laz. He took the necklace in his hands and um, tears were running down his cheeks. And he, he talked to his companions and he asked, he said that, if you permit me, if you permit me, I return Zainab's necklace back and fix some other ransom for Abar, Amar ibn Ulas. For this was the necklace of whom Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's beloved first lady has a Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha and had been gifted to whom? The beloved daughter has a Zainab radiallahu ta'ala anha. Memories of both, memories of both the beloved ladies come flooding to his heart, made tears roll down. What do we realize? the importance of women in the life of Prophet ﷺ, the importance of Muslim women in Islam, the position of women in Islam and the position of women in the life of Prophet ﷺ. How humble he was, how caring, how loving, how soft-hearted he was. And what happened was the companions, obviously, they all readily accepted and readily allowed, wholeheartedly accepted. And the ransom was then decided that Amr ibn Ulas, uh, the necklace would be returned and Amr ibn Ulas will allow Hazrat Zainab radiallahu ta'ala and who and her to come back from Mecca to Medina. And then when it was decided, Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sent companions to accompany Hazrat Zainab radiallahu ta'ala and her to Medina. And on her way, the people of Quraysh, they pursued her ride and scared the camel and she fell off the camel and she suffered a miscarriage. And uh, you know what? Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi on the day of the conquest of Mecca, he also forgave all those who had caused his, the fall of his daughter and his and her miscarriage. And um, we do learn that uh, Hazrat Amr ibn Ulas, who he later, he did embrace Islam and he came to Mecca. And uh, by some traditions, we learn that Prophet Sallallahu had uh, another uh, nikah. And by some, we learn that they carried on as husband and wife. And then we can uh, also repeat the incidents in our minds. Inshallah, I will be talking about it in future. The one of the uh, all those people of uh, whom they were here as captives was one of them was the uncle of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Hazrat Abbas radiallahu ta'ala, who, how Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was upset when he was moaning with pain because of being injured and how the companions had let him loose and how Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had very, very uh, with justice and being fair, asked him, asked them to chain him up again and how in the morning he had requested the people of Medina to give him a shirt and how Abdullah bin Ubay had given him a shirt and now when Abdullah bin Ubay passed away, Prophet Sallallahu offered his own shirt for the funeral of Abdullah bin Ubay since he had obliged his uncle. So inshallah, I'll be talking about this occasion inshallah in future. O oh, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, say to whoever is in your hands of the captives, if Allah knows any good in your hearts, he will give you something better than that, what was taken from you, and he will forgive you, and Allah is forgiving and merciful. But if they intend to betray you, then they have already betrayed Allah before, and he empowered you over them, and Allah is knowing and wise. Indeed, those who have believed and emigrated and fought with their wealth and lives in the cause of Allah and those who gave shelter and aided, they are allies of one another. But those who believed 
and do not emigrate. And for you, there is no guardianship of them until they emigrate. And if they seek help of you for the religion, then you must help them except against people between yourselves and whom is a treaty. And Allah is seeing of what you do. And those who disbelieved are allies of one another. If you do not do so, there will be fitna on earth and great corruption. Verse number 74, but those who have believed and emigrated and fought in the cause of Allah and those who gave shelter and aided, it is they who are the believers truly for them is forgiveness and noble provision. So here in this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioning who the true believers are and Allah is mentioning them two rewards, a reward of forgiveness and the noble provisions of Jannah. So Allah is here talking about two groups whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is labeling as true believers among the Muslims. So it means that Allah likes and advises Muslims to be in either of the two groups so that they can acquire the forgiveness and the noble provisions of Jannah. The first group is those who emigrate and fight, as did the emigrants of the Muslims of Mecca. But you know that sometimes the Muslims, all the Muslims, they might not be in a situation to emigrate. They may be women, children, old, debilitated, sick, poor. So what do they need to do is to be among the second group. So firstly, they can either fight, do jihad, be mujahideen, or they can be emigrants or muhajireen. This is the first group, which is liked by Allah. But if the people or the Muslims, they cannot be muhajireen or they cannot be mujahideen, then the second group is what? The second group is those who gave shelter and those who extended help. Who gave shelter and help to whom? Who were the Muhajireen and the Mujahideen. Very much like the people of Medina. So today even, those who cannot be emigrants, who cannot leave their homes, and who cannot do any form of jihad, can do what? They can present, they can provide their homes, they can provide their palaces for, for the people who are Hajru and Jahidu and help them and provide them as providers and supporters and helpers. Both can join hands for achieving the common goal, for achieving the common goal of preaching, of teaching, of implementing, and of guarding the messages of Quran and Hadith. Allahumma ja'alna minhum. Verse 75, and those who believed after the initial emigration and emigrated and fought with you, they are of you, but those of blood relations are more entitled to inheritance in the decree of Allah. Indeed, Allah is knowing of all the things. So in this verse, we can relate. We can relate and we can see that in the first verse of the chapter, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has highlighted and has stressed the importance of the relations of kin, saying, Aslihu zata bainikum. And in this last verse, again, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions about the ulil arha. So we need to realize how important the relations of kin are according to the messages of Quran. The first priority and the first order and even the last order and the last reminder of the surah is about the importance of the rights of the kins in our relationship. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us all with the strength of Iman. Help us all to be steadfast in our obedience and our reliance to your promises and our obedience to Allah and the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, help us, guide us to be one of those who participate actively in any form of jihad and make us humble mujahideen of Islam. Help us to be careful and help us to be dutiful and mindful towards our relations of kin. Allahumma hasibna hisabi yasira. Allahumma ajirna minan nar. Rabbibni li'indaka baytan fil jannah. 
اللهم اغفر لنا وللمؤمنين والمؤمنات والمسلمين والمسلمات ربنا لا تزغ قلوبنا بعد اذ هديتنا وهب لنا من لدنك رحمه انك انت الوهاب سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك نشهد ان لا اله الا انت نستغفرك ونتوب اليك سبحان ربك رب العزه عما يصفون والسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين امين ثم امين